Okay, so we're very excited to have Carl Hrdbacek um, from uh, Emeritus from CUNY um, City College to talk about the uh, about representations of unlimited integers. Go ahead, Carl. Okay, well, uh, thank you all for participating and especially uh, Roman, thanks to you for inviting me to give a talk uh, on a subject that's really not that closely related to non-standard models of arithmetic. Uh, but there is some tangential relationship. Uh, so uh, we all know about the work uh, uh, on using non-standard methods in the usual standard number theory. Uh, let's see, oh, there we go. Uh, by Renling Yin, uh, Terence Tao, Mauro, and many others. Um, I'm going to talk about the opposite direction that is formulating problem, number theoretic problems in non-standard language and then solving them by more or less reducing them to standard methods. Uh, this was um, uh, pursued by, this is pursued by uh, Abdel Majid Boudaoud and Jamel Belawar uh, from uh, two Algerian universities. And uh, here is an example of a typical problem that, well, really perhaps the main problem, main question they consider. Can every unlimited natural number n be represented in the form s plus omega one, omega two, where s is a limited integer and omega one and omega two are unlimited. So uh, first of all, uh, limited means the same as standard or finite, unlimited means the same as non-standard or infinite integer. I use this terminology as a carryover from uh, non-standard analysis where uh, for reals, where unlimited is the same as, uh, is not the same as non-standard, but for integers, it is the same thing. Uh, so intuitively, this question asks whether a large natural number is close to a product of two large natural numbers. Okay, uh, let me give some example of, some examples of results that uh, the two mathematicians I mentioned have proved more, uh, more or less, maybe not exactly in this formulation. So the first uh, result is that if we weaken the requirement that uh, of what it means to be close to just requiring that, requiring that uh, sigma is less than the smaller of the two numbers, then we can always do this and we can even impose additional requirements uh, such as uh, uh, omega one and omega two are mutually prime and are co-prime and omega one and omega two are of the same order where uh, to say that alpha and beta are of the same order means that their ratio is appreciable. That means less than some standard natural number and bigger than a reciprocal of some standard natural number. Okay, so how is this proved? Well, it's actually quite easy. Uh, we take uh, the integer part of square root of n as omega, which means that square root of n is between omega and omega plus one. So n itself is between omega squared and omega squared plus two omega. And now we look at four cases. The case where this case, uh, uh, when n is exactly equal to this, the case when n is omega squared plus just one omega, and the case where omega squared is, when n is just omega squared plus no omega. So uh, in the four cases, the following then happens. Uh, yeah, case zero, n is omega squared plus two omega. Well, then you just factor omega and you're done almost. If omega is odd, then uh, the two factors are odd 
So they are co-prime because the only possible div common divisor is two, and, uh, and they are of the same order, obviously. If omega is even, well, then omega and omega plus two have a common factor two, so you factor the two and lump it with omega, and again, you have it as a product of two integers of the same order, uh, which are co-prime, and in both of these cases, sigma is zero. Okay, now the second case is even easier. If the integer has the form omega square plus omega, one omega plus alpha, well then just factor omega and you have two co-prime factors and alpha is smaller than the smaller of them. Uh, case three, uh, two, well, uh, third case, uh, if we have omega square plus alpha, well then you, then you write it in this form, omega square plus omega minus omega plus alpha. And again, the two factors are co-prime of the same uh, magnitude and omega minus alpha is positive and less than omega. Uh, this time we get a minus sign, but uh, I allow that. Uh, and the final case is, uh, and it's just omega square. Well, then you add and subtract one and uh, uh, again, you have two possibilities, either the two factors are already co-prime or you have to factor two to make them so. So that's, that shows us that uh, the problem isn't, uh, well, anyway, this weaker, much weaker version, version of the problem is, uh, is quite easy. Uh, so let me give you a couple of other examples of uh, Buddha Wood and Belawars results. Uh, for example, if the number n is what they call smooth, which means it, it's a product of a limited number of factors and all the exponents uh, with which these fa prime factors that is, and uh, the primes are limited and the exponents are unlimited. Well, then we can write it in the form that the desired form as plus omega one, omega two with limited s. And in addition, we can make omega one and omega two of the same order and mutually prime. Okay, so again, it involves uh, some factoring. So I will give the proof for the special case when there are just two primes, let's say p and q, and uh, let's say alpha one, the exponent alpha one is even, is odd, and the exponent alpha two is even. The general case uh, follows the same ideas. Okay, so in this case we write, so n is p to the uh, two gamma plus one ta uh, times q to the two delta. Now what you do is you factor out p and then you subtract and add one and factor. So you, you end up with this expression here. Uh, since P is limited, this, this is going to be our S. So that's standard. And omega one will be this product and omega two will be the second product. Clearly they are of the same order again, because P is limited and clearly they are mutually, well, uh, their difference is two. So the only possible common factor is two. And so either they are already mutually prime or you factor out the two and uh, make them make the factors mutually prime. So again, this is uh, quite easy. Uh, now a result of general nature that I will not prove, but it's fairly typical of, of their work is that if you can write N in this form in some way, then you can always do it in this form with mutually prime factors, omega one prime and omega two prime. So I won't give the proof, but it, it involves a number of cases. And um, Okay, now one final result I will mention uh, is uh, the following. Um, Lucas sequences are a generalization of uh, Fibonacci sequence. Uh, they are given some 
integers a and b, non-zero with a positive discriminant, uh, they are defined in this way. So in particular, u0 zero is zero, u1 is one, and then un is the combination of the previous two values. If you take a equal one and b equal minus one, you get exactly the Fibonacci sequence. Un will be exactly the Fibonacci sequence. So uh, Buddha would proved in a uh, 2006, I think, paper that if n is unlimited, then both you and both of these sequence, the, the, then the unlimited terms, if n is unlimited, then u sub n and v sub n can indeed be re represented in this form. So again, I won't give a proof. It's quite involved. Uh, here are some references. Uh, this is proved in the second paper and the paper has 23 pages. So it's quite involved. Uh, the most recent published paper is this one, and you can find really dozens of results like this, uh, positive results that a certain class of integers can be represented in this form. Okay, so uh, what about the general uh, question? Um, I'm going to show that uh, the general question uh, has a negative answer. That means there are integers that cannot be represented in that form, assuming Dixon's conjecture. And I will say, I will state it later. And uh, also, if time allows, I will discuss some related questions. So this is also published in Journal of Logic and Analysis. Okay, now I will uh, work informally and speak as I have already been. That means um, in, in the internal language, uh, integers means what for some people would call hyper integers. The set N contains both limited integers and non -limit, unlimited uh, integers, non-standard integers. The same goes for Z. So the argument can be formalized in any axiomatic set theory or uh, in any elementary extension of uh, the standard model of uh, integers. I will state the final theorem in this model theoretic form so as to at least uh, mention models of arithmetic uh, twice. In, this talk. Okay, so let's recall the question. We want to write n as a standard limited integer plus a product of two unlimited integers. Uh, so first let's observe that if n, let's look at n and let's write its prime factorization and notice two things. If the number of factors is unlimited, then of course we can write and in that form, we just split the factors in half. We take half of the factors and pull, put them into omega one. And we put the other half of the factors into omega two. And, uh, and we have n written as omega one times omega two with s equal zero. Uh, similarly, if among these prime factors, there are two that are unlimited, let's say pi one and pi two, well, we let omega one equal pi one and the rest, the product of the rest, omega two, and again, we are done. So what is s equal zero? So what remains, uh, the possible counterexample has to have a form, some limited number of limited factors, which we can multiply out and get, get a limited number times one unlimited prime. Here we go. A counterexample has to be of the form a times pi, where pi is an unlimited prime and a is limited. Now, uh, while looking for, looking for a counterexample, we can assume that uh, the counterexample is a prime number because if we could write every if we could write every prime number um, in in this form. 
then we could write any multiple of any prime number by a limited integer in this way, which again has that form a times s is limited and these two are unlimited. So let us now assume that pi is a counterexample to f. And that means that for each limited number s, pi minus s cannot be factored into two unlimited factors. In other words, it's of the form a sub s times pi sub s, where a sub s is positive and limited. And pi sub s is, of course, unlimited prime number. OK, uh, now if, if, let, if you let s equal 0, we just see that pi sub s is pi. So we can write pi sub s here and rewrite this in this form. a sub s times pi sub s minus pi 0 equals minus s. So assuming that there is a counterexample, uh, there must be a sequence a sub s indexed by integers so that the infinitely many equations a sub s times x sub s minus x sub zero equal minus s have a solution entirely by primes. Now, I want to convert this into a standard statement. So uh, instead of talking about the infinite system, I talk about the finite system uh, of equations uh, of limited, you know, restricted up to the values of s up to q. So uh, co consider the system of Diophantine equations, a sub x, x sub s minus x sub zero equal minus s for s uh, less than or equal q in absolute value. And if there is a counterexample, then this, then for every q, this system has a solution by unlimited primes. In other words, has arbitrarily large by transfer, has arbitrarily large uh, limited solutions. So uh, the conclusion is that if there is a counter, if there is a counter example to the uh, representation conjecture, then the following standard statement has to hold. There is a sequence a sub s, uh, such that a sub zero is one, all the a sub s is bigger than zero. And for any positive q and r, th this system has a solution uh, where all the values of the solutions are prime numbers bigger than r. There are arbitrarily large solutions by prime numbers of this system. So maybe just to make things more concrete, I'll show you what the system looks like. Right? This is how the system looks like for uh, Q equal four. Uh, okay. Now, maybe I should stick to this for a minute. If you look at these equations, well, they are first order linear equations and they are equivalent to uh, sol solving the system is equivalent to solving a system of congruences. The first equation just says that x sub zero is congruent to four modulo a sub four. Similarly, the second equation says that x sub zero has to be congruent to three modulo a sub three and so on for all of them. So this is, uh, of course, a well-known general fact. Oh, but maybe I jumped ahead. I should also say uh, that conversely, uh, if this standard statement is true, then there is a counterexample because uh, if if, the, if we have a standard sequence with this property, then by transfer we can take unlimited Q and R that for which this system has a solution and. Uh, in in and in this solution, all the all the values will be prime. Oh, I'm sorry, what am I saying? Yeah, so all the x sub s will then be unlimited prime numbers, and a sub s is limited because the sequence a sub a is standard and s is uh, if s is limited, then 
a sub s is limited. So we have the we have a counterexample. Let's see, did I say this clearly? Um, if you have a standard sequence a sub s such that for every q and every r there is a, a solution by prime numbers bigger than r, well then take unlimited q and r and you have a solution for an unlimited system by unlimited primes. And so in particular, you have a solution for all the equations uh, where S is standard because S is less than uh, the unlimited Q. Yeah, so uh, the end of the story here is that um, all we need to do to get a counterexample is to construct a sequence uh, with the property from the previous slide with this property that the system has uh, arbitrary large prime number solutions. So let's uh, uh, let's um, uh, first uh, write down what I already said, that this system of equations has a solution if and only if <clears throat> the system of congruences, x is congruent to s modulo a sub s for the same range of values of s has a solution. Now, a question like this is, of course, well, I mean, this, this is like chapter two in a num number theory uh, undergraduate textbook. So uh, for this to happen, uh, the necessary condition is that if a number D divides A sub S and also A sub R, well, then X is congruent to S modulo D and also X is congruent to R modulo D. So S is congruent to R modulo D. In other words, the D divides S minus R. So uh, the necessary condition for solvability of this system of congruences is that the greatest common divisor of A sub S, A sub S and A sub T divides t minus s for all s and t s or equal q. Now, what does this uh, actually mean? It means that uh, if, you, if you take a power of a prime, like let's say p to the k, that divides both a sub s and a sub t, that means a sub s and a sub t are congruent modulo p to the k, then t and s are also congruent modulo p to the k. In other words, all the coefficients that are divisible by p to the k must be some number of p to the k apart. They must be in the same congruence class modulo p to the k. Okay. Whenever p to the k, right, all, all the coefficients uh, that are divisible by p to the k must be indexed by elements of the same congruence class modulo p to the k. So this condition is necessary and it's also sufficient as is well known. Uh, that's just a corollary, corollary of the Chinese remainder theorem and uh, I will does not prove it. So uh, yeah, the corollary of the Chinese remainder theorem and by induction, one can show that this condition is sufficient. And moreover, from linearity, it follows that if, if we have one solution of these congruences, let's say x0 bar, then every other solution is obtained by adding some multiple k, k times the least common multiple of these of the coefficients. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's clear also because if uh, if you let s equal zero, you have the homogeneous congruence. So to be for x to be congruent to zero, divisible in other words by every a sub s, well, it must be a multiple of the least common multiple of all these a sub s. So. Okay, so every solution of the congruence is of this form. Now, going back to the original system, uh, we 
work out what the we know what x, is, x sub zero is and so to work out the x sub s well it must be such that a, a sub k term x sub s k minus x sub zero k equal minus s and the x sub s must complement the x sub zero to make a solution so uh, from this it follows if you write if you put in what this is x zero k it follows uh, that uh, uh, a sub k times x sub s k is a sub k times a particular particular you know the xs bar that corresponds to uh, x zero bar uh, in the in this equation and uh, plus uh, this and then just divide by a sub k and we end up with uh, this result that the solution of the original system is a set of linear sequences of this form where this coefficient is just a sub q divided by a sub k. Uh, this should be a sub s perhaps. Yeah, right, this, this, this is a mistake here. This a sub k should be a sub s in both cases, uh, everywhere. Huh. All right, so. Yeah, here it's here it's written correctly. So the the conclusion is that if the condition about the uh, divisibility by the uh, greatest common divisor is satisfied, then the system has a solution, and all of its solutions are of this form. Now, of course, we want not just any solutions, but solutions by prime numbers. Everyone knows the famous theorem of Dirichlet that if you have one sequence and the coefficients are relatively prime, there are really many prime numbers in that sequence. Unfortunately, a uh, general version for a, a finite number for more than one sequence has not been proved, but there is, it's generally believed to be true. And there is a well-established conjecture which guarantees that uh, given any system of linear progressions with integer coefficients where bi is positive, greater than equal one, uh, there exist infinitely many natural numbers m where all the values of this, all the, the values of all the f sub i are prime provided that the obvious uh, condition that makes it impossible uh, fails. In other words, provided that uh, there is no integer that divides all of these products for all K. Now, what that this really means is, the condition is that if you take any prime number, it cannot divide all of the, it cannot divide at least one of these fi k for every k. In other words, for every k, in, in other, yeah, so given a prime number p, it cannot divide this product for every k. That means there must be a k where p does not divide this product. In other words, does not divide any one of these fi k. Yeah, so for every prime number p, uh, there must be a value of x, k, such that uh, p does not divide any of the values of the, these sequences. So we have to guarantee uh, that the solutions we have here satisfy this uh, assumption of Dixon's conjecture. We have to show that we have to choose the coefficients a sub k in such a way that for every prime p, there is a solution of the system sq such that p does not divide any x sub s, any term in this solution. Now, every, every, every term 
in the sequence is comes from some solution. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Now uh, the condition. This is not always true, of course. If you just take a single equation, mm. x1 minus x0 equal one and p equal two, well, then for every k, uh, any solution of this uh, has at least one has one even and one odd number. So for every k, for every solution, every solution has one value that's divisible by two. So we do need some additional condition. To, to guarantee that, and the following condition will do it. The condition E, uh, which says that if A sub S uh, has a factor P to the N, and that's the, the, the highest power of P that divides A sub S. In other words, P does not divide the rest of it. Then there must be an R such that a sub r is divisible by p sub and p to the power n plus one, and the distance between r and s between those subscript uh, those indices is a multiple of p to the n uh, with uh, u between u times p to the n, where u is between zero and p. So, what does this say? Remember that the condition c says that. Uh, the, the coefficients a sub s uh, divisible by p to the n must be spaced uh, at exactly p to the n steps apart. But it doesn't say that there actually have to be any coefficients divisible by p to the n. Uh, there, we might just take a sub s equal one, and it would certainly be true that uh, uh, Every time a sub s is divisible, but divisible by p to the n, which is never uh, the r minus s is so on. So, so uh, this is kind of the condition in the opposite direction. It guarantees that there actually are some a sub s divisible by p to the n for every p and for every n. For every p and for, n, for every n, there is actually some r divisible by p to the n plus one, and it's not too far from s. It's not too far from s. Of course, it must be a multiple of p to the n away from s, but not too far. Okay, so let's see where we go from here. Yeah, now the lemma uh, that's important here is that if we manage to produce such a sequence that satisfies both the condition C and the condition E, then for every Q and every prime number P, the system SQ has a solution such that P does not divide any X sub S in that solution. And that's exactly the requirement of Dixon's conjecture for our system of uh, linear uh, linear sequences. Okay, now how do we prove this? Well, uh, actually what we need to do is uh, take a slightly larger system and uh, show that a solution for it yeah no, given anyway let me go to the proof yeah so here is the proof so fix q and p um i want to show that uh there is a solution to the system of the for all S in absolute value less than Q, uh, which uh, is uh, not uh, divisible by such no excess is divisible by P. Well, so we take a slightly larger Q, namely we take the highest exponent such that P to the N divides A sub S for any S less or equal Q. The high, highest exponent such that P sub N 
occurs as a factor in any of these A sub S that we are concerned with for S less or equal Q, increase Q by P to the power N bar plus one and call that Q star. And we consider the system of solution of, of uh, equations for S less or equal Q star. Let's take such a solution. Well, of course, that's also a solution for the system uh, where S only goes up to Q. So all we have to do is that for all S or equal Q, this solution has the uh, required property that P does not divide any X sub S. Okay, so that's easy. I'll take some S less or equal Q, write A sub S as P to the N time S sub S prime where P does not divide this. Take R as in E, remember what that means. Uh, that means that uh, uh, P to the N plus one divides uh, A sub R, right here I'm writing it. Here is A sub R, here is uh, P to the N plus one divides A sub R. And uh, the distance between R and S is not too large. It's just a, it's just a small multiple of P to the N. So the equation a sub r, x sub r minus a sub x, x sub x equal x minus s, which follows from the system uh, equations by subtracting, uh, then tells you that this a sub r, which is this times x sub r minus a sub s, which is p to the n times a sub s prime uh, x sub s is equal to some small multiple of p to the n, where u is between zero and p. But if you cancel P to the N, you end up with P A R prime X R minus A S prime X S equal U. And if, and it follows that P cannot divide X sub S because then it would have to divide by U, but U is less than P and bigger than zero. So that's impossible. Okay. <laughs> so this, uh, this is certainly not difficult, but I guess maybe hard to follow. Uh, on a slide. So the remaining problem is to construct the sequence A sub S that satisfies the conditions of C and E, which means that again, that whenever P to the power N divides A sub S and also A sub R, the this, the, then S sub S and R must be from the same congruence class modulo P sub N, that's for the condition C. And conversely, for the condition E, whenever this happens, then P sub R, P sub N actually does divide A sub R and A sub S. So we have to space those A sub S that are divisible by P sub N exactly P sub N steps apart, the way it is in natural numbers, right? Uh, uh, natural numbers are divisible by P sub N if and only if they are congruent to zero modulo P sub N. So they are exactly P sub N uh, steps apart. They, they are exactly some multiple of P sub N apart. Uh, so for, for natural numbers, it's trivial, but we need to do it uh, for A sub S indexed by Z, not by N. And that means uh, we have to, scramble things up a little bit. Now, instead of going through these definitions and little tiny proofs that they involve, let me just show you a table that, that constructs the first 25 coefficients. Uh, yeah, here it is. So I'm, I'm going to construct the sequence A sub S with the two required properties, with the required properties C and E uh, for S less or equal 12. So how is it done? Let's start with A sub zero. The first row gives you the subscript and the second row gives you the coefficient. So let's start with N equal zero, where of course A sub zero is supposed to be one. So we just assign that. Now, all the numbers divisible by, let, let me start with an odd prime like three. All the numbers divisible by three must be in the same congruence class modulo three, 
but that congruence class does not have to contain zero. So we have to choose what I call an anchor other than zero. And the generally the, the choice of anchor I use is that it's the anchor for P to the N is P to the N plus one divided by two. I wrote that here somewhere. The anchor for P to the N is SPN is P to the N plus one over two. For two, it's a special case, but let's just look at the odd case. So the anchor for two to the power one, it, uh, I'm sorry, for three to the power one is three plus one, four divided by two, which is two. So uh, the, coefficient of a, the coefficient of A sub two has to have a factor of three. And then every other, coefficient whose subscript is in the same, whose subscript is congruent to two modulo three has to have three. So two plus three is five. It has to be divisible by three, perhaps higher than three to the power one. Uh, five plus three is eight. It has to have a, a sub eight has to have a factor of three. Eight plus three is 11. You have to have a factor of three. And also, uh, also going back, uh, two minus three is minus one. So you have to have three minus four has three, uh, minus seven has three, minus 10 has three, minus 13 or less three, okay? So that's that's where the factors three have to be in A sub N. Now, what about three square? Well, uh, the condition E requires that there is a three square not too far from uh, where you have three. So uh, by my, for rule that I chose, the anchor for three square, which is nine, would be nine plus one over two, uh, five. And that's indeed where you have three square. And then every nine steps, you have to have three square. Five plus nine is 13. Well, that's already not here. Uh, five minus nine is what? Minus four. So you have to have three square there, at least. Minus four minus nine is minus 13, that's already again out. Okay, the, what's the anchor for three cubed? Uh, 27 plus 128 divided by uh, two, which is 14, so that's outside, but then 14 minus 27 is, well, I guess we don't have three cubed, that, that's outside of the table. So let's try the prime number five. So the an anchor for five is five plus one, six over. Let's see, the anchor for five is five plus one, six over two, which is three. So here we have five, right? Then three plus eight also has to have five. Eight plus five, well, that's outside, but uh, three minus five, which is minus two, uh, minus two minus five is minus seven, minus 12. That's where you have five. Where do you have five squared? Well, at uh, 25 plus one, 26 divided by two, which is th 13. So that's, that's outside, but 13, but on the other side, uh, 13 minus uh, 25 is minus 12. So no. Uh, I guess, uh, what did I say? So five square, 25 plus one, 26 over two is 13. So the anchor for five square would be 13. So in this box here, I would have five squared. And in this box minus 25, which is minus 12, that should be five square perhaps. Maybe this is a mistake. Yeah, this, this possibly could be five square, I think. 20, 13 minus 25 is minus 12. Yeah, this should be five squared. So that's a typo. And well, one, one more example for seven. Well, seven, uh, the anchor is eight divided by two is four. And then four plus seven, 11, you have to have seven and going right, right back the other direction. You have to have seven at minus three and so on. Uh, finally, let's look at two. The anchor for two is one, which means all the, Odd numbers have to have two, one plus two, three, five, seven, and so on. Um, the anchor for two square is minus one. There is a formula for that. So minus one has to have two square and then minus one plus four, which is 
three has to have at least two square, three plus four, seven has to has, have at least two square and so on. Uh, for two cubed, the angle I think is three. So that's where you have two cubed plus also three plus eight, 11 has to have at least two cubed and three minus eight minus five has to have at least two cubed and so on. So I don't know, I hope this is uh, now clear how the table is constructed, how these how these coefficients are constructed. And it's also clear that the two, two conditions are satisfied. Whenever some prime number appears uh, in some location, then the same prime number has to appear as a factor uh, prime number p has to appear as a factor in uh, the same location plus p and the same location plus 2p and so on. And uh, the same goes for the higher powers of these factors. So a simple uh, argument shows that in general, uh, this sequence satisfies the conditions c and e. I will not uh, go through that. I think my time is not uh, is coming to close, I would rather say some other things. And so, so we have shown that the uh, sequence can be constructed. Therefore, we have proved the, the announced result, which in model theoretic terms would say this, if Z star is an elementary extension of Z, proper elementary extension of Z, and assuming Dixon's conjecture, in Z and therefore by transfer in Z star, uh, there exists an unlimited omega in Z star minus Z, such that every integer in the galaxy of omega, those numbers that differ from omega by a limited amount, can be factored as a limited number A sub S plus a prime number pi, unlimited prime number pi. And uh, it's easy to, see that in the construction I just went through, uh, the only prime number in this galaxy is pi sub zero. All the others have some non-zero coefficients. Well, rather than giving the proof, I'll show you the table again. But you remember, uh, the only, the only a sub n equal to one in this table is this one. Everything else will have some prime factors. That's easy. So this is sort of the main result of this talk. Uh, uh, Karel, yeah. Uh, I, can I just ask a question at this point? I, I was listening to the lecture with Jim, who had to leave now. I told you that he would leave at some point. Yeah, yeah. But before he left, he had a question, and maybe it's a good time to ask it now. That So Dixon's conjecture is used. Is there any sort of form of reversal that, assuming your result, something about Dixon's conjecture? Well, it's a special case of Dixon's conjecture. It's equivalent to a special case of Dixon's conjecture. I don't know if it's, I, I don't know if it's equivalent to Dixon's conjecture in full strength. Yeah, I mm -hmm. thought of it, but a little bit, but not much. Uh, it doesn't seem that likely, but uh, I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it yeah. certainly gives you a special case of Dixon's conjecture. For this particular system that I defined here, right, mm -hmm. is the coefficients A sub S, I have just defined, uh, we have to, if, if, I mean, yeah, if, if the, if the, uh, the conjecture about representation is true, then this particular, in these particular systems have prime number solutions, arbitrary large prime number solutions, but they are particular, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The coefficients A sub S are quite uh, strictly con uh, constrained, so, uh, I, I don't know in general, but it's possible that it could be equivalent to the general case. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, okay, so I just said that in this galaxy, uh, there are there is a single prime number, namely, yeah, there's a single prime number, everything else is a composite, but one can also, one can modify this construction as to, make a galaxy where everything is a, 
limited multiple of a unlimited prime, but there, there are no prime numbers, or on the other hand, there are infinitely many prime numbers. So uh, let's see if I can say something about the case when there are infinitely many prime numbers. Unfortunately, the proof I have in my paper is wrong. <laughs> uh, one quarter is not necessarily an integer, as we all know. So uh, here is a, so I have a correct proof here, probably not enough time to go through it, but you list all the prime numbers in increasing order, and then you construct the sequence of anchor, the sequence S sub i, such that in the coefficient A sub S sub i will always be one. That means A sub S sub i will always be a prime number and there will be infinitely many of them. And the anchors have to be chosen so that S sub i is not congruent to, uh, so that is any no S sub i is congruent to any of these anchors. Um, uh, again, I have a table here that illustrates how that's done. Uh, you choose zero as S sub zero and assign it one. Uh, Next, you choose the anchor for two, which is, uh, and take the next number that's not congruent to zero, in other words, one. Uh, next, you choose uh, the number that's not, uh, what? That's not congruent to the anchor for two, which would be not congruent to one, so we could take two. Everything from now on has to be even, the, all the sub i have to be even. And so we choose two and we assign it value of one. Then we choose an, an anchor for the next prime, which is three, so that it's not congruent to zero and two. Well, we can use one again, no reason to do that, no reason not to do that, as long as you don't do it ad infinitum. Yeah, the, the one thing to uh, be concerned about is that no A sub N accumulates infinitely many factors. But uh, in the example I worked out, it's pretty clear that once your prime number gets uh, big, it will not appear in any of the coefficients in a small neighborhood of zero. And so the sequence A sub N is really well defined. Oh, well, anyway, uh, maybe my time is uh, coming too close, so I will not go through this step by step, but it's an inductive procedure. Every once in a while, you get a, an a sub n equal to one. And uh, if you're careful, you maintain the, the two properties that are required, namely that uh, uh, if two appears at some location like three, it must appear in, uh, or one, it must appear at every odd number. And if three square appears, I, didn't, I don't think I even went as far as considering the squares here, just the first powers. Um, if seven appears at four, it also must appear at 11 and so on. The same requirements, but you know, somewhat more careful construction. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, say a few words about uh, some other, uh, so, some consequences of this and some other results. Um, I mentioned the, the, the result of Boudaud and Belawar uh, where they show that if n can be written in this form uh, with s limited and omega one, omega two unlimited, then it can also be written in this form with omega one and omega two prime, mutually prime, co-prime. So an uh, analogous question is, if you can write n in this form, can you write it in also in a form where omega one prime and omega two prime are of the same order? And from the result I just proved, it follows that the answer is no, because basically what you do, you take z star, you take z, z star, and then an element, an end elementary extension of z star, which will be z double star. And then you, the end, element, end extension is important so that uh, all the z star integers come before the unlimited integers in z double star uh, that are not in z star. And uh, then you just carry out this proof uh, on the pair z star, z double star, 
and we obtain a definable sequence and primes in Z double star such that this holds for all S in Z star. And we can easily arrange uh, to make A1 uh, to be unlimited from the point of view of Z, that means from Z star minus Z. And then, then we get pi zero is one plus A1 pi one, where A1, A1 is unlimited from the point of view of Z. And of course, pi one is also unlimited from the point of view of Z. So uh, pi zero is in the required form, but we cannot, write it in the form omega one times omega two. We cannot write pi zero minus s in the form omega one times omega two for omega one, omega two of the same size, because if we did, well, then this would equal to that. And the prime number pi s would have to divide one of these factors and the other factor would have to be limited because it would have to divide a sub s. So this shows that uh, this shows that uh, this conjecture is false. And uh, well, there are some other questions uh, that, uh, that have been asked. For example, can every unlimited natural num number be represented in a form like this with omega? Well, if you, without any further assumptions, it's trivial, but so that omega one is of the same order as omega omega i and omega j are all of the same order, which is still easy. Uh, and uh, uh, the proof is, so the answer is yes. Uh, and the proof is quite simple. Yeah. And uh, finally, uh, there is one more question, uh, namely, does there exist an unlimited prime number p of the form S plus omega one, omega two, where omega one and omega two are of the same order. Um, now, this is obviously true if we assume the n square plus one conjecture, because uh, if there are arbitrarily large n such that n square plus one is a prime, well, then we take an unlimited n with that property and we have a solution. But uh, one can work out if one works out the standard equivalent of this question, it comes to something that looks very much like, uh, like uh, at least a special case of the um, Bunyakovsky conjecture or, or conjecture that uh, that there are quadratic uh, quadratic uh, polynomials that contain arbitrarily large that have arbitrarily large prime values. So I'm not. I guess I don't have time. To do that, and since it's 1.59 by my watch here, I thank you all for listening and that's the end. Okay, thank you, Carl. Let's, let's thank our speaker. Um, and Hello. I am happy to open it up for questions. So go Hello. Sure, who's this? I can't hear. Hello. I can't see. I can't see where who, who's speaking. Hello. Uh, you can go ahead. Hello. Hello. Who is yes. speaking? Uh, Mr. Carol, how are you? Yeah. Hi. Is it Mikhail? Hi, uh, Mr. Jamal. Hello. Are you listening? Yes, I can hear, but I don't know who is speaking. Okay, uh, Billawar, Billawar. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, on, on the representation of every positive integer n uh, can be written in the form of omega one, omega two, plus omega uh, three, omega four. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in, your, uh, in your proof, uh, omega one, and uh, omega three are uh, are uh, two two primes. Are two primes. So, so uh, my my question uh, is uh, if we, we fixed if we fixed omega one and omega three. Yeah. Uh, that is unchanged. Un omega one and omega three are are fixed. 
so we ask if uh, n can be uh, written in the form omega one, omega two, plus omega three, omega four, uh, in uh, at least uh, k k different ways. Uh, with k is uh, is a standard. No. Okay. So. If you don't fix omega one and omega two, and if you simply no, add, no, 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 we fix yeah. omega uh, omega one and uh, omega three. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 certainly the method I used certainly proves that there are infinitely many ways to write n in that form with omega all the omega i of the same order. Now you're asking if you fix two values, of course, carefully so that they are roughly square root of omega. Are there then ways to okay. write, write it always? Okay. Well, uh, I would think that the argument in my proof actually would show that uh, that that's true, but I, I am not sure, of course, offhand. Mm -hmm. But the argument is basically follows that line of reasoning. Where is that? It's over here. Yeah. So okay. the way the argument goes is you choose, oh, I see. Well, you have to fix omega one and omega two. You want me to fix omega one and omega three uh, and they don't have to be primes even. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't but know. But we, we fix P1 and P2, okay. Yeah. But uh, but uh, uh, here I something I didn't uh, understand something uh, for infinitely many uh, re representation. Uh, on the other hand, uh, omega is uh, is fixed. The left hand side, omega, is fixed. Yeah. And uh, here, why, here, uh, here omega here omega is fixed as a integer part of square root of n, I guess, or something. Do I say that somewhere? Yeah, I say the only omega i are approximately square root of omega. So yeah, now you could use cube root of omega or, or higher roots of omega, higher standard roots of omega. So there would be infinitely many solutions, but I don't know if you fix omega one and omega two in this formula here, if you fix omega one and omega three, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. This one, okay. Yeah, I don't know if for fixed omega one and omega three, uh, which are, which are, uh, comparable to, I don't know, square root of omega, whether you can always find omega three and omega, omega two and omega four. Yeah, I don't know. Mm. Uh, no. Okay. Mm. Uh, the second question uh, in uh, your speech, I uh, pl please, if you uh, uh, g give me a few explanation about uh, the existence, uh, no, no, about the uniqueness of uh, the prime number pi zero in uh, the galaxy uh, G. -G. G. The, uni the uniqueness. Well, uh, uniqueness. In, yeah, yeah uniqueness. I understand. Yeah, in that galaxy, there mm. is a unique prime number. Uh, but ah, of okay. course, you can have a different galaxy which also has a unique prime number and have these properties. Right? The, the solution, mm. the example is not unique. I, I like uh, you have the system of equations um, ah, okay. and you find a prime solution uh, by infinitely, by unlimited primes. But of course, there are, there are many such solutions if, if uh, Dixon is right. So you could take any of them and you would get different galaxies. You know? uh, okay. yeah. So there are, there are many galaxies that would have this property if Dixon is right. Okay, uh, fi finally, uh, we talk about uh, the generalization of this problem in uh, matrices with integer uh, entries or in uh, unlimited Gaussian integers. I think uh, uh, the problem uh, can be generalized with the Gaussian uh, integers. Yeah, that's possible. I have no idea about that. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, thank you so very, very much uh, for uh, this uh, good uh, presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Mm. Uh, yeah, okay. I have a question. Go ahead, Ken. Um, yeah, uh, you use Z star and Z double star. 
Um, is it necessary to work with elementary extensions of N and Z, or could model non-standard models of PA do just as well? Well, a non-standard model of PA can be. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's uh, it's 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 not necessary to use. Z as the base model, which is what basically I'm, I've sort of quickly said here. Uh, instead of Z and Z star, you can use some Z star and Z double star, right? So Z star that is not, not a standard model of N, of piano arithmetic or integer arithmetic. And uh, all you need to do is that Z double, that the larger model is an end extension of the smaller model. That's the smaller model that can be non-standard. Every non-standard model has an end extension, and for that pair, the non-standard model and its end extension, the argument works. Yeah. Oh, Karel, but but what about Dixon's conjecture then? Yeah, well, if so, it's so, an so argument, do you, do you, so do, would you assume that it's provable in PA? Oh, oh, well, PA. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. Right. Of course, the, the non-standard, the, the 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 ground model has to satisfy Dixon's conjecture. Right. No. Yeah. Sure. Right. So, which in this case it is true because Z star is an elementary extension of Z. Z satisfies Dixon's conjecture, so Z star does, and then therefore Z double star also does. Yeah. So, in order for the argument to work, you need Z star and Z double star, uh, where Z double star is an elementary extension of Z star, and Z star satisfies Dixon's conjecture. Yeah. Right. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's thank uh, Carl again. That, that was a very nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. You're welcome. Um, next week, we have uh, Lorenzo Galliotti uh, speaking about order types of models of arithmetic without induction. Um, so please, uh, and at the same time, so uh, please, please join us. And again, if you have any interest in, in uh, speaking at MOPA, please reach out to me or Roman um, and we can make that happen.